YouTube. We have a box. We're gonna open it right now. Brian Phillips here. We're gonna open this box. We're gonna build this plane and we're gonna make it fly through the air and it's gonna be super fun. We're gonna show you how to do it. And if you're new to the channel, welcome. We open these things. We said, whoa, F for you, Corsair. It's the V2 from FMS. It comes with the reflux. Amazing. How big is this one anyway? This is 800 millimeters. So the last 800 millimeter was 750 millimeters, which could be a little disappointing if you're expecting <laughs> this and you get that. But we're gonna tell you what it really is. That's one of the things we do here on Brian Phelps RC is we try to throw boxes off the table and fail miserably. Okay, what do we have here? System specs, 800 millimeters. Okay, it's actually 800 millimeters, 31.5 inches. Overall length, 660. Flying weight, 445 grams. Motor size is 30, 15, 700 kV. Uh, so 1700 rotations per volt. Uh, and this one's gonna fly on a 2S pack, which would be 7.4 volts. And it is a 30 millimeters by 15 millimeters. Uh, that's what a 3015 uh, motor size means. 20 amp ESC. So if you went to 3S, it might survive or it might catch on fire. It's kind of your choice. Um, okay, prop size 7.5, four blade, delicious. <laughs> and as you can see from the box, we got beautiful navy finish. I believe these are fixed gear, and I believe we have a steerable tailwheel, but I'm not sure about that, so we're gonna find out right now. And if this comes with the reflex, what that means is you have a stabilizer included with the airplane, so it's a plug and, plug and play, uh, meaning you have to provide your own receiver and transmitter, as well as a battery. But then, since it has the reflex V2, you can just use a non-stabilized receiver and you'll be able to get the stabilization and auto leveling, which we'll show you how to turn on and off when we put in our receiver, which will probably be an AR620 in my estimation. Okay, great, so here's the box. Yay, look at that, fancy. All right, so as you can see, we have a box that has been well packaged, no issues there, it's small, and this is not a huge plane. Uh, we have a zero over there that is of the similar size class. Mm -hmm. That one's 750, even though I think it's 750, right? Yeah, it was smaller than the 800, but that's like the size class. Yeah, size class. Size. Yeah. yeah, so rather than being a 1.2 meter or 1.1 meter, it's an 800 millimeter. Beautiful finish. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and pull this out. See how light that is. That's weird. It's like ultra light. It is really light. Okay, so first initial impressions, we have the goal shape wing, which is the uh, polyhedral shape here, which is pretty cool. I just, polyhedral would technically be two bends like that, but this is a goal shape. And uh, you have an anhedral and dihedral, which is pretty cool. And it looks like Megan's favorite, the camera crew's favorite feature. I there are no control that, horns yes. installed, which we hate when they do that because it means we have to spend a lot longer to build the same plane. We have a little bit of wiggle here, not a big fan of that. Looks like the missiles go in here. If we're gonna install them, we don't always fly with ordnance on our planes, uh, just especially the smaller planes. But this feels like it's got some reinforcement, but mostly in that um, goal area. And then it just kinda got a little bit of flex to it. It's not a ton of flex. Uh, for its size class, should be plenty of strength. So that's good. And of course, this one's from FMS, if you had already connected the dots when we open the box. So that is an inboard, uh, inboard elevator, pinch hinge design. So there's no reinforcement on that hinge. So again, this size class calls for lightweight. Feel how light that is. It's like nothing. It's so weird. Yeah. Um, and then of course we have a manual. This manual looks like it's an old style manual. They've included an insert to help you figure out the reflex mm -hmm. v2 which does come with a special usb a to usb c cable for firmware updates and things like that if you would need to do that i haven't ever done it yet so i'm not sure what that would entail and i want to point out one problem with packaging you see the prop the prop is right here so that's oh, not where yeah. it's supposed, supposed to be set down so let's see if there's any damage here guys looks like the prop did not damage the plane that's good but look where the prop is did it fall down 
Oh, uh, no, it's It was there. actually like this. It was even further It up. was more like that. So I think it was taped down and then it just popped out. So beautiful prop. Yeah. This one is an FMS 7.5 by four. So that means that it's uh, 7.5 inches this dimension or this dimension here. And then the uh, four inches is four inches of penetration like that. So the pitch would be four inches. And then this looks absolutely gorgeous. It's small, beautiful details. I love the panel lines, not a bunch of these little bumpy things that mm -hmm. I don't like to see. And then these things, if you didn't know in real life, actually open up to uh, allow more venting. So that's the motor is black with this black simulated engine. So that's pretty sweet. Lots of resistance as you turn. So that usually means it's nice, powerful magnets. And then this is evidently the little lady that's pretty cool. And then this must come off, I have to assume, but goodness gracious, it did come off, but it was a little bit sticky. I had some residual glue on mine, more than likely. And so you can see just a little bit of glue probably stuck there, but no big deal. Probably might be inclined to put a piece of tape here, except that there's a lip. Mm -hmm. And that lip is going to make it hard to add the tape. And that pilot is gorgeous. I love that the, I mean, pilot's a little big in there. Um, but you're kind of in this in-between no man's land size. So it's hard for them to get pilots in this size class. Even in today's day and age. And some of the pilots we get in airplanes are super ugly compared to the planes. And I think that that's something that the model companies could work on. That one's not. I like the way that that mm -hmm. World War II pilot looks. And we've seen them in a bunch of different planes. And I like the scale in some of them a little better. But I like the look of this one. You know, and that might not be... That might not be the wrong size. It just seems he probably wouldn't be quite that big in an F4U Corsair. It's a pretty big plane. So the pilot would not take up that much room in my estimation. Beautiful detail here. Mm. We normally don't see ordnance that actually is worth a crap on this size class. Wow. They're just a, like kind of a non-issue. So those of course would be inboard drop tanks. And you can see that the mounting point is way back on the back half of that, which is pretty cool. I don't know if that's true to form. Uh, but it definitely looks cool, so that's neat. So we'll have those. I don't know if it came with missiles, actually. It doesn't look like it on the front picture, anyway. Yeah, they don't really showcase them if it did. Okay, so there's a couple more packages in here. Let's see if we can rip this foam off. We've got it mostly empty. Obviously, the nut and bolt sack is going to be really, really stuffed. It is, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so we got a landing gear. Absolutely beautiful landing nice gear, details. which is something we noticed in the uh, Zero mm -hmm. and then the T28 that we've done so far in the size class. We're also going to be doing the P51, guys. So if you're curious about that, nice free spinning, but rock hard, rock hard, useless tires. And you know what? They do work fine. Um, simulated Oleo on this bogey, which is pretty cool. That little thing would normally spring in real life. Springs are kind of a... You know, if you don't get them right, they don't really add anything to the plane except for complexity and likelihood of breakage. So I kind of don't beat them up over that. But at the same time, when I'm looking at landing gear that are super scale and I'm looking at a beautiful 1.7 millimeter tire, I'm still saying to myself, self, why is that not a squishy pneumatic tire? I mean, I love a big squishy pair that I can grab and play with and uh, makes no difference how small they are on the plane. If they're soft, you're going to have an easier time on touchdowns. If they're just bouncy, then they might actually be worse than hard tires. It just depends on the way the airframe goes together. And we've seen it time and time and time again. Uh, if you have a trailing link like down on uh, this uh, J11, which is the opposite of the SU27, uh, which is a current model from FMS, you've got really good shock absorption even with a hard tire. But you have to have those springs tuned in just right. Okay, so we got more packaging, more foam to protect the foam from the foam, and we have some missiles. Awesome. Oh. Okay, cool. Now, unfortunately, these missiles look like they have to get screwed in. Oh no, you glue them in and then you really? can unscrew that and put a blank in. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's pretty cool. Interesting. So I'm not even really sure we're gonna put those on. Ah, maybe we will. They look pretty cool. Oh, they're so cute. I wonder if cute little missiles. They are really cute. The, the fins are kind of uggo. But yeah, I bet they, there's one side versus the other. No, they're flat. 
So yeah, you would just glue those in there like that and you could take them off with one screw. So I wonder if it's painted under there. Hmm. Or do oh. They, or do they give you a... I don't know. There's no blank that I've seen yet. I just said that out loud thinking there would be a blank because it's appropriate for that, but... I think I'm gonna not shoot missiles from this plane. I might do the drop tanks because I can put them on and take, take them back off. off. And those are, you know, easy to identify on the F4U Corsair. Yeah. The missiles are neat, but let's get down to it. I want less drag. And generally these ones are a challenge because they have a JST connector for the battery. And you have to figure out where to cram a 2S pack. And you've also got the reflex in here. So, you know, we may almost have to do a lemon on this just to make it work mm -hmm. because it's so dang small. And that being said, let's talk about that. I'm gonna, we're gonna pause and come back with receivers. Okay, so this is what we would normally do is like our go-to six channel receiver. As you guys know, we work with Spectrum and with a bunch of other companies. Uh, another one that we used to work with a lot was Lemon. So we have this thing here, which is just a Lemon six channel without any stabilizer on it, okay? So this is very basic, very simple, but it's in the DSMX platform, DSM2, DSMX, okay? This is DSM-2, DSM-X, and you do get a little teeny tiny bit of useless telemetry on this. Okay, and in my opinion, it's useless. But there is some telemetry. And just remember, you've got full duplex communication from your transmitter to your receiver, and most people don't think about that, but at the end of the day, you actually do have a transmitter and a receiver here, and you have a transmitter and a receiver here. Okay, so just because you see a diversity antenna does not necessarily mean that it's two receiving antennas. It just depends on the system. So in this case, you're gonna get more robust straight from Spectrum, good connections, but it is a little bit bigger. Now, if you ever run into a situation where you really wanna put the Spectrum in there and you don't wanna you know, cheap out on the Lemon, okay, or something similar, some other crappy Chinese brand, the Lemons we've had pretty good luck with, so we actually like them. Um, you can take apart the receiver and you can get this receiver actually a little bit smaller than this one. But this thing would be in the tune of like seven or eight grams. I mean, it's very light. Same you, thing with this. You don't have antennas on that though. Yeah, you don't have antennas on this and you also don't need a bind button or a bind plug for this, which is nice. Again, we're not talking about forward programming. We're not talking about AS3X. We're not talking about safe. That's where you really start getting the value from the spectrum pairing, in my opinion. But if you're just operating with the, the DSMX platform, I think this might be an okay time to use one of these. So we're gonna try this, we'll see how it works. Um, and spectrum will come back to this on another one. And here's why. We have six channels and I'm just gonna consume them. Ready? Throttle, elevator, rudder, ailerons. Reflex on off. Reflex on off. That's it. And we have an extra one. Thumbs up. So you could use an AR-410, which is even cheaper. Okay, uh, just to be frank, the, the Spectrum stuff is not the cheapest. It's definitely not the most expensive. For those of you who say it's overpriced, you're kind of crazy. These are just really dirt cheap, okay? These are appropriately priced, and then you get into the JR and stuff like that, and you, or you, know, you get into some way more expensive stuff. So we're not even like in the Spectrum of Spectrum of expensive. Okay, so let's not even go there because you can spend hundreds of dollars on a stabilizer to pair up with your receiver, okay? But this is not the echelon of plane you're gonna put that in, let's just be clear. So this would be a great option. This would be a great option. Maybe we'll link to both, I don't know, whatever. Whatever one we use, we always link to, but in given the circumstances, we'll probably link to both. And if we're not gonna use a stabilizer because we already have a stabilizer in the reflex, should be no problem. Now. We get this question all the time, and I know you're like, Brian, get to the point. We need to see this thing built yesterday. You have a fast forward button. Anyway, what I was gonna say is this Reflex V2 has proven to be a very good utility, but, but it's not as good as AS3X and safe, in my opinion. On a plane like this, it'll be fine. It's gonna be okay. It'd be better if it was ASTRX and safe, because then you would be able to really refine it and make it nice. But the thing is, you're not gonna need that. Okay, now that being said, AR410 is cheaper, so that might actually nudge the price point even closer to Lemon RX. So just to give you an idea, we're not here trying to price sell stuff, we're just trying to bring it to your attention. You can decide what meets your budget and demands and however you like it, okay? So there's that. 
All right, so where are we gonna put stuff? We're gonna have, well, weirdly enough, I almost feel like that thing's gonna fall off. And yeah, I'm also gonna grab, loose. I'm gonna grab some glue. Some glue? Uh, let's grab some glue. Okay. I got some different glues here. We're gonna bring some glues over. I want some foam to foam. Oh, we have China glue right here. Look. Oh, good. Where did that come say. from? Where's this China glue bin? I don't know. They're like reproducing in the drawer. Really? Can I don't sell know. It? <laughs> so I'm gonna grab some scissors too. Okay. And then I'm gonna grab my uh, vase of not flowers. Yep, still, still not. Whatever, I got your flowers out one time. <laughs> Look how that worked out. Okay, so let's talk about some glue choices. A, E. This is still very, still very gone. <laughs> okay, then we've got this huge tube of clear glue, That's... also known as mucilage. And yes, the uh, warnings do exist here, but on Hobby King's website, the uh, active ingredient says magic. Yeah, you can't do that in the United States. So evidently in China, it's okay, in China. So then this, this is from a speaker repair I did. What? And I don't know if this will actually work. So you have to be careful when you get solvent-based products, you can melt foam, so just be careful about that. But this plane's painted. So you might be able to use some glues that would normally not go on foam. So just a thought. And then this is just a straight up you know, from the black market, China glue. China, okay? China glue. We know China glue. We're experts in China glue. Mmm, smells delicious. Okay. Don't smell your glue. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this thing together and it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be really, really good and, oh, oh, I tripped. Oh my goodness, oh wow. Whoa, ah, dang it. Safety feature fell off of the plane. Did you find the nutsack ever? Yeah, it's oh. one, one bag. So if you look, guys, there's nothing left in there. It's empty. It is. It feels empty. So oh, there it is. what we have is okay. millions of different random items in here. And really, it's not going to be too bad. No, it's not. Yeah, it's, we only got four. So that being said, let's talk for a minute. If we have an extra channel, okay? An extra channel means you could do flapperons, okay? Now, yes, I know what you're thinking. Brian, how am I going to do flapperons on a non-stabilized receiver using a reflex? That's impossible. Well, first of all, I don't know that it's fully impossible if you were to stick this thing in that thing and make things happen. Oh. But I'm just going to go ahead and put that over there, and we'll put that in the pile. Of, oh, that didn't damage the cabinet. Hopefully not. Um, we're going to put that over there and then pick it up later and put it in the pile of other ones that we have disregarded. I'm not going to waste my time on it. So. This or this will allow you to do flaperons, but you won't have stabilizer on one of the two ailerons, mm -hmm. okay? Because we already talked about it. We have six channels and we had a thumbs up left, which means because there's no retracts on this, obviously these aren't retracts unless you rip them out like I did to that one the other day, which they were, they were good retracts. It's just that it took half the fuse with it. Okay, but on a plane of this size, flapper with a small outboard aileron. Yeah, is, outboard ailerons are going to make this thing even, hokey. Yeah. It's just not really necessary. And that's what lame people say. Are you calling me lame? No, I'm saying that's what lame manufacturers say. I don't like it when they're like, oh, you don't need, this plane doesn't need flaps. Well, let me tell you something. I don't need an airplane either. I'm not gonna die with that. Well, I mean, I mean, I need this one, right? And that and one. Like those, and then this and like ball game those and this and lamp. Those. And, yeah, and, oh, okay. okay. Those, okay, maybe I do need that. But, flapperons, if properly equipped, are effective in certain applications. Just keep in mind, guys, outboard ailerons, Flapperons never work quite as good as an inboard flap. They don't induce the right drag at the right place. They don't change the angle of attack right. They also, you have to correct with the elevator the opposite direction, what's normal. It's just weird. I don't think they work as good. But if you have an AR630, you'd have an antennaless solution and you could do that right on board, which would be nice. And all you do is just forward program it once you get it set and then the AS3X knows what channels to control. But again, if you have two ailerons, 
what do we have? A redundant control surface. You have one that goes up, one that goes down. Now that's not to say that up is effective as down. It is not necessarily as effective. It's more effective going up and less effective going down. So that means that you will get kind of a wonky behavior. Is it worth it? I don't know. You guys be the judge of it. For once, we're gonna do it without flaps. And listen, if I wanna put flaps on this sucker, we already did this on a 1.1 meter that we did for Hobby Zone. And we had to make from a singular inboard flap or a singular inboard flap, or I can't remember which one actually it, it actually was, because this whole thing in real life would be a flap, okay? And it's like a three piece feather and it looks mm -hmm. really cool. The thing is, if you have just the inboard, it's super lame looking. So I guess I kind of want to throw a bone to FMS on this and say, yeah, it's kind of expensive to make that feature on a small and otherwise light wing, especially a 2S power plant. You know, we're not talking about a powerhouse here. You're like, Brian, it doesn't seem like you're talking this plane up very much. No, we don't do that on Brian Phillips RC. It's not the cheapest, fastest, bestest, bluest, whatever -est. This is just what it is. And we show what it is and that's why we do it is because you guys don't have to buy it to find out what it has. You know, you don't have to vote for it to figure out what's in the bill. You just let us read the bill to you very tediously. In fact, we could probably read the bill shorter, shorter order than this probably. video. Uh, even if it's 4,000 pages and it just came out at nine o'clock this morning and we're voting on it today. So anyway, getting back to the point. The point is, I'm gonna dump these things. Oh, oh geez. that was not Spill a good move. Sack all over the place. I just, I just dumped it right there on the counter, right in front of her. Just awkward. So I'm gonna just put this stuff over here and ignore them until we get to a better spot. This is gonna look sweet though. Look at that. Oh, cool. So cool. Yeah. Okay, so that's gonna go around the motor. Then this is gonna go like this. It's gonna go like this, like this. This, this is going to go on this, like this. Is this where we're starting? This is where we're starting, I guess. <laughs> and then this. Now, how do you know which direction is forward? Well, the yellow goes forward. Normally the print is on the front, but this one deviates from that principle. Oh. Okay. The yellow in this case goes forward. Now, also note to self, I like to keep my hands in good shape. Okay. I don't like getting cut by props. If you don't like getting cut by props and you're not sure you can handle it, then don't put your prop on until you're ready, okay? I have another note to you. I saw stickers for the prop. Yeah, It'd I know. It'd be easier to put those on now before oh, you put that on there. You are so good. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, these are some hu huge- I love prop stickers. These are huge stickers. Oh, those are wet stickers. Oh, no, they're not. They're just regular. Wait, wait, are they? Oh, they're wet. Okay, oh. so we need to get some warm water and we're gonna slide them onto the wing surface and it's gonna look totally gorgeous. Actually, you could just do like a tray. I'm gonna turn the water on. We'll just waste some hot water for YouTube. It doesn't need to be hot. Okay, go ahead. Good enough. All right, guys, look at this. In living color. We're gonna do this right now, okay? I'm assuming that I'm just gonna slide all this crap up here. Those are my screws. I uh, don't know exactly how this works, but I'm just gonna boop. Wouldn't that be funny if it was just a regular sticker? <laughs> it's just like stuck it in the water. Okay, so we're just gonna let that soak. That is not very much depth. Isn't that what they say about me? <laughs> So I'm gonna do this one all, oh, you know what? Now I'm kind of regretting my decision to do that. Is this actually a regular stick? I'd be a little bit embarrassed, but not so embarrassed that I can't recover. I mean, I've done dumber things on camera. Is it just really stuck to the back? Oh thing? crap. Okay, guys, so what you're gonna wanna do is pause the video and go back like two minutes and just, just pretend like that didn't happen. I'm trying to read it, it's hard to read. It's so dang small, guys. It says like Hamilton standards. Yeah, there is definitely an up though. Yeah, oh yeah, I just put it on that way. Okay. So yeah, so what you're gonna wanna do is just take this um, plate and quick, look over there. Look over there, no. what is that? Oh, is it the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> and just peel this off. 
That was some CGI like you've never seen on Brian Phillips RC. There's just a little bit of water here. I don't know who did that. <laughs> Tell the kids to clean up after themselves. Yeah, that, yeah, I would not recommend getting your sticker backing wet. Um, now, I, I assume this goes here, but I guess honestly, I'm not, I'm not 100% certain that that's right, but I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna go with it. That might actually be supposed to be going somewhere else, but I'm just gonna go ahead and stick it on there. Ooh. Uh, yeah, that's supposed to be inboard on the prop. Yeah, so if you ever stick a decal on something and it's kind of like maybe not quite exactly where you want, I do have a trick up my sleeve, okay? And my sleeve is, well, I have a sleeveless shirt on, so. Well, it's not sleeveless, though that would be an interesting look. Yes, I agree. So if you ever stick that on there and then you look at the instruction manual shortly thereafter, and you realize, you know what? That would probably look better inboard more. Should be able to just pull it right off. But do it sooner than later. Don't let that adhesive bake on there. And then, I don't think I got that very straight, folks. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of a glutton for punishment here. But if you've ever watched this channel before, you're gonna already know that because we have literally thousands of videos showing you how to do all sorts of fun things. Uh, some a little bit more exciting than others. And we're gonna help get you in the air so you can enjoy this wonderful hobby. Remember, after all, the best way you can support us is watch videos like, subscribe, Click the bell for notifications and buy the planes when you like them, whether it's a you know, plane that you absolutely love or something you're interested in that we kind of answered your questions on, so you're ready to pull the trigger now, or if it's something that maybe, I can't, like I'm actually having a hard time telling, oh crap. Put I, that put, I put that one up, so it's supposed to be like this. Okay, well now I know. I couldn't tell because the letters are sort of hard to read. So I'm gonna flip that over again. Gosh, that's twice I Do you need to this. go get your eyes lasered again? Probably. So for those of you that don't know, I got LASIK, um, LASIK Plus on my eyes because I was blind for a good chunk of my life. And when I say blind, I say that somewhat facetiously. I wasn't legally blind, but I was pretty darn close because I couldn't see the alarm clock with digits that were green like this big from about that far. I was neither sighted. That's what I called it. <laughs> But if you were to ask the doctor, they would say I was nearsighted and I'm like very, very nearsighted. So yeah, so my hopes of aviation were uh, sort of dashed by that when I had my first class medical exam as a youngster, a youngster getting ready to go into college. And so um, I've always wanted to fly in one way or another and so now that we have this property, we have been working on building a full scale runway as part of our efforts here on this YouTube channel. And in the meantime, I've been working on PPG. And of course it's winter here, so we haven't done much with that. <clears throat> but I do plan to fly from here and then eventually at some point in the future, I'd like to fly ultralights and then work my way up if I ever have enough money to do so into a general aviation aircraft. Whether it be an experimental or a sport or something like that, I don't know. It just depends on uh, how fast and when, and if the money would ever come for something like that. Because I love aviation and we like to spread the joy thereof. Aviation and radio controlled stuff, obviously. But yeah, so if you see a runway out front and you think, boy, he's lucky he has a runway in his front yard. Well, just remember we're paying for that for the next 29 years excuse me, 28 and a half years or 27 years or whatever it is. And then we are also paying on other stuff, the other piece of land. So it's not free to do this stuff. We love it, but it's expensive. So when you buy stuff, you do help to fund some of those big capital improvements and moves. And we wanna put a pond in this year if we can afford to find somebody that will do it. And if the ground will accept it, because yeah. you do have to have some clay, you can't truck in clay, it would cost, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars to do that. So nobody does that. You just dig a hole and it fills up. And uh, then the other big project we got going this year is a building, if it's this year. And we're not sure the order. Yeah. But you guys will be part of it if that happens. So we're gonna share. So as you can see, and by the way, if you're ever curious about this house, we don't get asked very often on it, but we built this house while we were doing the YouTube channel. And we do have a playlist on it if you're curious, because mm -hmm. people ask all the time. Uh, we're kind of an open book when it comes to these things mostly because we know that we owe a lot of our 
success to having this YouTube channel and you guys have been great to us. Um, but much of what we have here was earned from working our tails off for many, many, many years before the YouTube channel, just to be clear. Yep. Okay, so we'll stick this on here. All right, so that looks so much better. Thank you, camera crew, for bringing that up. It looks really cool. It does look really cool. I mean, these these little planes are not chumps when it comes to scale features, no. I must say. Now, that being said, there is a bit of a trade-off, and that is that they fly a little bit quicker than their bigger counterparts. And quicker is not necessarily more scale looking. And for me, that is sometimes a conflict. So the T28 did pretty good, but I felt like it needed a little bit more flap action to make it work. Boy, that just, it's definitely going and crimping down on that prop. But you see, I'm having to use my index finger to kind of hold the, the motor housing and there's no pass through. Normally you would have a screwdriver Mm -hmm. and you would pass it through and then you could really crank that thing on there, but not in this case, evidently. So yeah, guys, beautiful looking. Yeah, absolutely very cool. gorgeous, very scale looking and very inexpensive for what you're getting. So just keep in mind, you know, back in yesteryear, it used to cost a lot more to build these planes and they used to be a little bit less good, if you ask me. I mean, there are a lot less features and the technology wasn't as good on the radio systems mm -hmm. and there certainly wasn't as many aids to help you fly. So if you're wanting to get into the hobby, you're in the right place at Brian Phillips RC. We help new pilots all the time and we review new planes, planes for beginners. We review planes that are a little bit more expert. And I don't like to toot my own horn on expertise because I am not an expert pilot by any means. There's people that are way better pilots than me, but I do have a certain level of expertise in piloting that I have earned over the course of what, eight and a half years of flying. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more you fly, the more you're gonna pick up. So if you wanna get to being where you want to get, keep flying and do more of it. It will help shorten the duration of your noob status and also help, you know, uh, waste less time. So if you're wanting to get real good quicker, then just practice a lot. Not like I'm real good, I'm just an average guy that does happen to fly. So that being said, big long screws, three of them. Looks like this one is a little bit longer maybe. No, they're all the same. And then these ones are small screws, which are probably going to work for these. Now it's possible we have to glue them, but it looks like we have screws. So I guess I'm gonna just go with screws, okay? So we'll put the ordnance out of the way for the moment. Landing gear, we're not gonna put on until a little bit later just to keep it out of the way. And then of course the canopy. I did get some glues, but I don't even know if we need them. Oh yeah, we're gonna need them because we gotta glue the tail on. That, yeah, I think so. So what I'm thinking is that it's gonna be easier to do this now so I'm going to take this. You see how it's got a pass through? Mm -hmm. So there's two pins that line up and then two pass throughs. And those pass throughs are going to allow you to run screws from now the top and then bite that. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this into the wing. And it's not a great match on color. It's actually kind of a terrible match. But it's fine because it kind of does blend in even though it's a terrible match. Okay. It's navy. I mean, it could be black, it could be white, would be even worse. Mm -hmm. And we see that a lot of the times. Okay, so I'm just gonna drop this down now. This is one of those times when it's kind of hard to remember which one's which. So I'm gonna pull that back out by accident and I'm gonna look at it again. So it looks like I want my outboard on the rear. Outboard on the rear, okay? I'm gonna just take one of these little screws and drop it in, and hopefully I'm getting this correct. Sometimes I get this backward, and hopefully you can just catch your mistake early if you do. Just grab a screwdriver and then run that in. Nice looking color. Don't have to glue it, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, I like it. And you guys will notice a little bit of compression here. That's from me pressing, but that actually grabbed and pulled in there. You're not gonna notice stuff like that once you get the plane put together. It's really, honestly, when you're new to this hobby, you're gonna make more of that than it really is, okay? When you work with foamies, they do tend to get dinged up a little bit in that regard, and you're not doing anything wrong if they do. It's just part of the media that you're working within, okay? So if you, if you can't tolerate that, then you're in the wrong media. You're gonna have to go to balsa wood planes but learn to fly with something that's cheap, resilient, and easier to repair, and that would be foam. So that looks pretty good. 
<clears throat> okay, and then this servo, of course, is going to stand up. It is a nine gram digital, and it's, I uh, can't tell if it's metal, that's plastic gear. GDP, FMS 9 GDP. Uh, nine gram digital plastic, okay? So that's what GDP stands for. If it was a metal gear, then it would say like M, G, M, it would say G for gram, then metal, then digital digital mm -hmm. or something like or M digital. md what would it be it'd be nine gram d it'd be g d m G -D nine gram digital metal got it thank you okay or something like that doesn't really matter it's not a huge issue it's just that a nine gram digital servo or a nine gram servo is going to tend to be nine grams but the thing is if you have a 13 gram servo it's the same size and it's you know, you know, so it's heavier. You're going to add quite a few grams if you do that on all of them. Granted, there's only going to be four servos on this plane. It's not a big deal. And also, this is uh, definitely a four-channel plane because you have ailerons, elevator, rudder, steerable tailwheel, and did I get the right one? It's the outboard one, isn't it? Nope, it's the it's this one, the inboard one on the back. Same organization as what you have over there. So dumb question. If you're only putting two screws in, why'd they put four holes in it? Uh, two of them are alignment pins, just to hold down the oh, weight okay. cost. Um, and to be honest with you, as long it goes quicker, as far as I'm concerned, I like it. Well, yeah. You could glue them too if you want, but we've done enough models where we've glued and screwed them. And, and to be honest with you, they just, we haven't had one break, like ever. They break when you crash because you crash. Right. And when you crash, I'm gonna just let you guys know something. Things do break when you crash into other objects that are stationary mm -hmm. or even moving objects, especially if they're moving in the opposite direction. Um, so if you're expecting a plane to not be damaged when you hit something, then you're probably going to be disappointed a lot. So just avoid hitting things, uh, which is easier said than done. So as you're, as you're new to the hobby. Okay, so we got those ones on, pretty simple stuff. Now we're gonna do the same thing on this. It looks like we have another bag here and there's just basically uh, two more and then two linkages. So those linkages, of course, are gonna be for the aileron. So I probably grab what would have been for the elevators um, and the rudder, but it doesn't matter. I believe they're exactly the same in this kit. Sometimes they're not, so you wanna pay close attention if they're not. Uh, usually depends on if you have a big difference in control surface size. Okay, so that bag's now empty too. And that bag came with these little fuel tubes, which are kind of like a rubber band that help hold these doohickeys, these clevises closed, okay? Once you clip them together, but don't clip them together until you're ready because you don't want that little head to slide into the hole and uh, because it will rip off, mm -hmm. I know, which uh, just makes me cringe thinking about it, getting your head ripped off after it's stuck in a hole. Anywho, so we're gonna go ahead and do that and they'll probably wanna fall off like that, but we'll see if we get lucky. And the next move is, of course, we have to make a decision if these are the bottom or the top. Let me see, this is gonna be the top for us. So we'll put these in. You definitely need to do this before you get it mounted because if you don't do this now, it's gonna be a real pain in the neck to put them on later. Now, also, I just wanna mention, I'm not a huge fan of having two control horns for elevators. I feel like it's a very good way to have problems, but it's also sometimes better than having a control rod that's not effective. Uh, if you have a rod that's glued in here that goes across and then comes back, you almost always have good mix because they, they can't be, you know, separated from one another. But in this case, you have two linkages, so you have adjustability because little, little doohickeys like this can be screwed in and out. But of course, these are really cheaply made, super coarse, so there's not a huge amount of adjustment because every adjustment you make is so far each time because you have to make a full rotation to get in position to do that. That's why I prefer these to be a fine thread machine screw where possible, okay? So this is very coarse thread, as you can see. It's almost like a plastic self-tapping screw, okay? And we do have some scenarios where we've been burned by that, but it was on ultra fast planes. In fact, it was the SU-27. We had one that was defective from the factory. So anyway. Um, and okay, so we're gonna put this here. Then once you know where the first one is, you can just replicate that scenario 
to get all the different holes plugged with your doohickeys, also known as screws. So we're gonna do these real quick, and it looks like the, this one has short, like there's a short screw in this batch. There's a couple of short screws and a couple of long screws, so I'm assuming we can use the short screws on this trailing edge of the elevator because it's gonna be, of course, thinner, and so you can reach a little bit easier and get to the other half of the equation. And then you have similar penetration of the head of your screw, if you look real close here, in here, okay? So simple, and then this just moves up and down. You'll also see that I've squished this a little bit. I don't know if I did that, but you'll never notice it once it's on the plane, so. Don't worry too much about those things because those things are just kind of part of the media, like I said earlier. If you don't know what I mean when I say media, I mean like the type of building materials. So the media that we use to build or the media with which we work in, okay, not to be confused with your TV media or Brian Phillips makes media on YouTube. All right, cool. Let's stick this down here. So once we get that done, pretty simple stuff, looks good. Definitely is transferring the load nicely. Obviously, anytime you wanna transfer load into a foam object, you have to kind of dissipate the load so you have a wider surface area so it doesn't rip through. Because if you just had like this thing, cut it off with scissors and stuck it in and glued it, you could probably get it to work because there's just not that much resistance on a, a pinch hinge like this. But what's gonna happen is, you know, if it breaks free, it's gonna be a catastrophic failure, okay? So we're gonna lay that aside for now and then we're gonna do the fuse, the last one here. So this one's the rudder. So you can tell which way you do it because you wanna to go to wherever this rod is, okay? So obviously we want it on this side. Okay, so we can stuff that in there. And then that's gonna move the rudder. I love that this has a rudder. And some of you guys are thinking, well, why not just bank and yank? You know, well, the reason it's not Bank & Yank is because Bank & Yank is an inferior flight performance. I want a rudder even if it's an inadequate rudder, okay? I'd rather have an inadequate rudder than have a not inadequate rudder. Or excuse me, I'd rather have an inadequate rudder than have a rudder that doesn't exist. Yeah. Does that, that Yes, was, then was have one. no rudder. Yeah. Yeah. Because like the T-28 did not have enough rudder authority. But if you have a rudder in place, it's much easier to like add clear plastic or something like that to really get that authority out of the machine um, as opposed to going in and adding a whole servo and putting control rods all the way through the fuse and all these different things that are quite challenging. It seems like it'd be easy, but it's always harder in practice when you go out and actually try to do some of this stuff that you see me do on this channel. You're like, Brian, you're making it look really hard. Okay, get back to me once you've done it a few times. And there are a lot of you who have done it a few times, believe me. But the noobs that don't know anything about it yet and haven't had an opportunity to fail like I have, you'll understand better after you've done it, okay? So just like anything else, you have to have an appreciation for what it takes to do certain objects or certain, certain tasks in order to, um, you know, appreciate the skill that's required. And that's one thing that's true about flying radio controlled airplanes, building, repairing, filming, doing a YouTube channel, all these different tasks that we do that's all wrapped up in this experience for us. A lot of them take skills that are weird. So flying radio controlled <laughs> airplanes is a weird skill. I mean, you, you wouldn't, you're watching somebody fly and you're like, how hard can that be? Just try it once and you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll immediately be quivering in fear your butt will clench so tight that you'll have to take three weeks to get the cramps out and then you will crash into a house. So I'm like, it's not as easy as it looks and that's the cool part of it is because you can have all the money in the world and not buy this skill. You have to learn it, you have to do the work and it does take time. It's unusual in the environment with which we live, which is instant gratification, download this video game right now, get this application right now, never pay for anything, of course and then just do it and then all they do is data mine you and next thing you know you've got advertisements for you know banana hammocks in your email <laughs> so what i'm going to say is fly, flying radio controlled airplanes do not usually lead to banana hammock ads but it could depending on what you're buying um okay so this this is going to be wide in if we're doing um uh, looks like they might already have a y let's see if they do there should be an aileron Y somewhere. 
That doesn't say anything. Why do they never app? They never label the ailerons. Right. They're like, well, I mean, obviously it's ailerons. Right, but it's not labeled. I'm like, why would I, why would I just assume that? Oh, because it's plugged into an aileron port. I guess that's a pretty good argument. Oh, and then look, here's an aileron plug that's like, oh, these ones are the ones that are going to actually go into the receiver. So I'm, you know, this feels like it's not stuck down very good. Um, yeah, probably from the fact that it's like leaning out. Not. Yes. Now. Just to be clear, this is a spatially aware object. It needs to know where it is in time and space, and it does matter. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the wire since I have it already ripped up. I'm gonna stick it in the hole, and I'm gonna press it hard. I know. You hear it squeak? Yeah. It likes it. Oh, but sometimes you can do it too hard. Nah, <sighs> no, not all that. It's nonsense. So we have an elevator. We have an S bus PPM mode, which by the way, if you don't have enough channels, let's say you use a four channel receiver on this, you can plug any of your channels that you can manipulate on or off. It could be the throttle. Well, you wouldn't want to use probably the throttle channel because you'd have your ESC plugged into it, but you can plug in whatever you want there and it will remember the mode that you pick based on the status of the flashy light that's on here or the color of the flashy light. So if you want stabilizer on and you know you're not going to turn it off and you want to fly this with an AR, 410 and save a few bucks, you can do that. And we have now learned to do it. I feel like we did that on the Viper or something from Hobby Zone. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, is all you have to do is literally hook up, unhook your rudder servo, plug it into this, change the status, and then unplug it. Never plug it in. It will go power cycle when you power it back up, same mode. Shut it off, power it back up, same mode. Yep, even if it's not the default mode which should be, I think, off, but I don't know. Stabilizer, auto leveling, I would not ever recommend to keep on all the time. You need to be able to shut that off as you advance through the rings. If you're learning to fly, generally don't learn to fly on an F4U Corsair. The wing type is a little bit complicated and aerodynamic qualities and the P factor are probably gonna be an issue. Okay, so now that I've discouraged you, let's go ahead and stick some things together and see if we can enjoy it. Okay, so we have two different servo wires that are kind of chasing through, being in the, in the way. And it might not be a big problem, but it kind of is right this exact second. So I'm gonna do some cable management as we go. Oh, by the way, guys, if you wanna help support us, what you can do is you can buy these airplanes as you like them. And okay, so that's throttle. So I'm just gonna unplug that and I'm gonna just untangle it real quick. And there's links in the video description below to help you. In fact, we just got another domain for short links and it's called BPRC Neat, you're in my light. More. I'm in my light, there we go. Somebody's in my light and it's me. I'm gonna go under this, ah, I don't like that tangle at all, but I don't wanna get mixed up on where my cables go. So I am just gonna pull this out. Now, a million times I've been asked how do I hook all this stuff up? Well, to be honest with you, it should already be hooked up. But if you have to pause the video, now would be when you would be able to pause and look at things. Also, if you're having trouble keeping up with the pace of this video, which by the way, is a pretty slow pace on this video, but sometimes we blast through stuff pretty quick, okay? Doesn't matter which aileron, just plug them in because an aileron channel is one channel with opposite acting control surfaces, okay? and they're redundant. So, okay, so brown to brown, yellow to yellow, yellow to yellow, brown to brown. Okay, clipped in, no problems there. Um, and so because they're, they're redundant control surfaces, then you can literally plug them in either way and all you have to do is just rotate the channel direction and it will, it will flip how it goes. Okay, so you see this tangle? I don't like when they tangle stuff. So I'm actually gonna fix that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually intentionally go under this first because it'll be easier for me not to mix up which wires which and then I hate when those are way down at the bottom because then it makes it really hard to see polarity of the cables okay so this is throttle and by the way that prop is making it a real pain in the butt to do all of these steps because of the fact that it is constantly wanting to get in trouble so I'm kind of longing for the time when this is together it'll be a lot easier to hold it okay and this thing's so small you can't really use a plane stand on it Okay, so I don't like that. I'm gonna unplug that. Okay, and then I'm gonna just untangle, untangle it. Okay. 
And then we're just gonna stick it back in the rudder. Okay, so supporting with two fingers underneath so I don't break the foam off because it's just a little piece of foam here, okay? It's very thin here and it's thicker here, okay? Um, also, I'm going to, now that we've done a little bit of cable management, I'm gonna pull up on this. Just kind of walk that into the fuse. I'm gonna put the nose, the little key is gonna drop into the wing. As you can see here, I'll flip it upside down so you guys can watch. Just drop that in like that. Then we're gonna lay this down with the prop over the edge and just try to get that thing to push in. You see how it's not wanting to line up? Mm -hmm. See how I have to kind of bend? Watch this. See how I did that? I just grabbed and pulled the tail. It made it open right up. Okay, now be careful that tail is not gonna be as strong as you might imagine it could be. There's three screws provided for the long screws here, two of which are gonna be used here and they're just gonna go through and then they're gonna hit this plastic kind of support clip thingy. Mm, that is, screw is awkward. I'm using kind of a small screwdriver for this too. I wonder if my other screwdriver would work better. That's actually a flat screwdriver and it seems to be working better. Go figure. Now I'm choosing, show the people the tail. You see the tail, how it's clearing the countertop, but I'm pressing oh. onto the prop. Yep. Better to push on the prop than it is to push on the horizontal stabilizer or vertical stabilizer, uh, depending on how you're manipulating and holding your plane. In my case, I'd rather put a little bit of pressure on the prop shaft and motor mount than I would on this thin and weak foam. There's some support more than likely in it, but I don't know for sure that there is. And so for that reason, we err on the side of don't break it in half. You're going to break it the first time you flip it anyway. When do we flip planes, camera crew? When you're landing? Yep. Or specifically? That's when I generally do. Yeah. <clears throat> when the wheels stop and the plane doesn't, that's when you flip over. This actually worked really good with this flat bladed screwdriver. I did not expect that to happen. Now what I'm doing is I'm looking at this surface here as they mesh together. I'm also looking at how tight that is. So it's really like so far so good. See how it's starting to push mm -hmm. really hard. It's starting to pucker. You can see these pucker lines here. That's how you can tell you're tight. Tight like a toyga. Okay. So very good. All right. Starting to look so sweet. All right. You've got all these cables puking out. <laughs> So this might not be a terrible time if you were trying to do a little bit of cable management. I'm going to show you how I'm going to cable manage my stuff. I'm going to just take all the memory in the cable, get it together. I'm going to fold it and then I'm going to just try to tuck it in between the opening. Okay, just like this. Just stuff it in when you got room. Okay. I'm sure there's some videos online that could teach you how to do that if you look hard enough. Where is the battery going? There, and that's what I'm kind of thinking about. You know what, that's supposed to go under this, isn't it? These are supposed to come under that, totally under that shell. Yeah, I know. I feel the same way you do, but that just happened because I had to. Watch this, guys. This is what was supposed to happen. That's supposed to be under there because otherwise you undermine your ability to actually put to actually put the actual thing in the doohickey. Okay, see these wires? Mm. You gotta leave room to stuff your battery right. in there. Okay, that makes more sense though. Okay. So now, did they say what size battery they recommend? Uh, you read it on the box. I read it and then immediately forgot what it mm -hmm. says. 800, 800 milliamp hours or something like that. I suppose the manual might say, why don't you check the box, I'll open the manual. Uh, 1300. Huh? 1300. Ooh, 1300 million pounds. 20 C. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, it's a small plane. It doesn't have a lot of load requirements. Yeah. All right, so now we need to, we need to put this in here. And so, yeah, there's, there's no screws. So if you try to put this in, um, it's gonna, you know, you gotta do something to hold it in place because it's, you know, gotta be secured and stuff. That looks sweet. The it lines does. on this are awesome. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I like that the prop actually has a little bit of size to it, which is cool. I mean, it's a little annoying when you're trying to build it on the counter, but it's really good. Slide me all of these said tubes, all please. Of said all tubes. of the said tubes. This is when you're gonna need this stuff, guys. Okay, this is actually China glue, it's the right one. This is extremely flammable. This is some thing that I used for fixing my speakers, but I think it's probably the same. Really? Smell it. You tell me that's not the same as this. Well, can I smell the other one then? Smell the other one. They smell exactly the they same. They do smell exactly the same. <laughs> How was your night last night, Brian? It was amazing. What'd you do? Sniffed glue. <laughs> well, you don't really need an elevator anyway, right? Here, look. Oh yeah, that's right, per Ian. Ian. Ian says, look, <laughs> Brian, properly, properly adjusted sailplane doesn't need an elevator. Is that really how he talked? Actually, he kind of did talk did that he? way. He wasn't this good. Brian, we've been waiting forever for this. Hurry up. <clears throat> It's not Ian in the background, it's somebody else. Ian was a guy who sold me an airplane and it was a gorgeous plane. And this guy was like super skilled pilot and he had some idiosyncrasies about him that I enjoyed. Cause I enjoy people's idiosyncrasies. I have a lot of them myself, you may have noticed. <laughs> some people call them character flaws. I call them um, story starters. Story starters. Okay, so I'm just taking this glue. I'm just sharing the wealth. This is supposed to be used on speakers. So we're gonna find out here in a minute if it works as good. Now I can tell you this from personal experience using it on speakers. It is extremely strong. And this is already tacking up something fierce. Okay, so that's gonna well, be interesting. Better, I mean, get it in the hole. Listen, don't rush me. You can't stick it in before it's ready. It's gonna be ready. Are you sure? Why are you putting it on the end? I'm putting it on oh, the end because it end. needs to needs to be on the end. Jeez, camera crew, you're being so pushy. It's not gonna work if you're pushy. Oh man. It'll work. Just get it in there. Yeah, I don't Stop know. That's sniffing it. That's kinda, weird. <laughs> I'm seeing if the chemical reaction's done. I'm not trying to get intoxicated by it. So guys, listen. If your kid's watching this, first of all. Get your parents' permission first. Yes. Second of all, don't sniff your glue. We are adults. We know how to deal with chemicals safely. Um, but generally speaking, it's not safe to smell glue. <laughs> so that's why we just did it with a bunch. Um, okay, so as you can see, I've spread this. It's going to be like a contact cement. Contact cement here. Okay. And it's probably going to glue down like really fast. Yeah. Okay. So I hope I can stick it in the hole and actually get it I done. I know, I'm concerned. Are you really? Well, I'm also concerned, dang it. Oh geez. Oh geez, that's super sticky. Just go quick. I don't know. Usually it's like not sticky until the end. It's usually kind of, you know, like you can slide it in, but then it's just sticky at the end. Get in there. Oh, I'm pushing the rudder out of the way because this needs to drop down. So I'm gonna pull the tail down just a hair. Once I have light again, the camera crew's not it's blocking. still you. Okay, good. Got that down. Hey, that worked pretty dang flawlessly. Well, hasn't burst into flames yet. Rubber adhesive, definitely made in China. Extreme, no, I'm just kidding. It doesn't say definitely. It does not say either of those things. It doesn't say made in China, it doesn't say definitely. Well, it's. Both. Mm -hmm. That looks like it's, uh, holy cow, that's really sturdy already. Maybe I found a new product. Okay, well, that was easier than it should have been or could have been. Uh, you do need to make sure that this is square and true to the aircraft. And uh, just to give you an idea, guys, pretty crazy, right? The China glue would do the exact same thing. It's just, I'm only excited because this has been in my drawer for like a year and a half doing nothing. I'm just excited because you're going to use it up and then keep an empty tube for the rest of our lives. You know me so well. So I'm just going to put this over here, guys, next to the manual that I'll disregard shortly. And uh, now that we have everything sort of almost assembled, let's just finish it. Okay. Let's stick in the weird hole the landing gear, these pop in sort of weird and then you have to, I'm glad there's a perfect angle for you guys to see that. I'll do, nope, 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 stay where you were. 
I'm gonna do this side now. Okay. They want to try not to your light. They go the same way. What the heck kind of malarkey is that? I wanted to show the people, and it's they go the same way. <laughs> I thought you'd be moving, so it'd be harder to see. All right, so then we're gonna do this. Okay. Derp. Derp. Oh. Derp. Right like this. It goes into the hole, into the hole, and then it latches, uh, sort of. Okay. Then this thing. This doohickey sticks in the other doohickey. Ah, dang it. Sorry guys, kind of an awkward angle. Probably should have done the other one first so I could reach better. And uh, full disclosure, there are times when it's quite difficult to reach things that um, I'm trying to hold this so the camera crew can see, but then I like can't do it. Okay. See that? It's just a weird thing. It is. Once you get it in there, it's like, oh, well that makes sense. And by the way, these are the same. Both sides are the same. So if you would break one, um, they're essentially this. Oh, you know what? That does not seem right. Those landing gear are on the inside. They should be on the outside. That isn't right. I totally did that wrong. No, they should be. They're not the same. And they should be on the outside. Really? 100%. Yes. They Look at the picture. If you don't believe me, I am correct on this. Oh, okay. Look. In. Yep, I see. They go either way though. So yeah. like if you if you had ordered the same. two pairs and you broke one of the two, then you could do two lefts or two rights and they'll still physically work. They'll just look dumb. Sometimes they won't actually go in because they're actually mirror images of one another. Not so in this case. And yeah, that's definitely right there, camera crew. That looks, yep, that looks good. Sense. Yeah. And they just snap it. It's kind of a weird setup. They do look really good. They do. And they did on the T28 too. Yep. The little T28 looks sweet. And they were good on the Zero too. Yeah, they were. Very detailed. Mm -hmm. You don't generally see this type of detail on this size class. Yeah. FMS does a great job in that regard. Okay. Very nice. Cool. Love it. Okay. So now continuing onward, we need to get... Aileron control horns need to be installed, but you, you now I'm going to lay this down very gently okay. because now I'm bearing load on that like we were trying to avoid, okay? So I can't even really install these by rights. I have to get the radio done yeah. first or at least part of that. Okay, so now I also want to show you my extra screw. There's four of those and then there's one of these. So four of those, one of these. Hmm. So that's pretty cool. And if you're anything like me, what you're going to do is you're going to put this in this bag like it's important. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to put that bag with other bags like they're important. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, you can go to the scrapyard and retire. Mm -hmm. If only. I won't do that. No. I might need them. I know. I might open a hardware shop. And if you use all your screws, you're still going to want to keep your bag in case you ever need a small bag for anything. I probably will. See, that's the thing. I will use the scrap and that's what scares her. <laughs> okay, so the next move for us is to do the radio setup portion. Now, let's talk about where the radio could go, okay? Because we need a 1300 milliamp 2S pack, correct? Correct. So something like this Venom, 2S 1300 milliamp hour pack would work, okay? But there is one looming issue. Yeah. The XT60 will not stick into this. And that is, again, one of my gripes with this and all the models of this size class. Who threw this thing on the ground like a no. lazy bum? <laughs> not gonna take it from me. Don't worry, they're not good for um, me anyway. So, <clears throat> oh, that was me. I'm just looking into my beer cooler to see if there's another battery that has that, and there isn't. So what I have to do is I have to use an adapter, mm -hmm. and do I have an adapter like that there, camera crew? Well, I'm trying to remember what we did last time this came up. We probably built one and put it in the plane and left it in the plane. So I just, you know, I could just walk into the living room here and just pick up the Zero and just bring in the enemy aircraft. Enemy aircraft! So cool. Okay. So let's look inside. Boop. Nope. Nope. Okay. So but, you can see on this one, we put an AR-631 in there. But does that one have reflex? No. Well, I mean, you could get it with reflex, 
but I don't think we got this one with reflex. Yeah. Okay. So that being said, I mean, if you, if you want to set up your plane, just like we did the zero, you could actually watch the radio setup. If you buy yours as a plug and fly without, or you want to strip that out, then you could watch that to actually set it up. Cause it's exactly the same radio setup. It'll just be, you might have to reverse a servo here or there or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So we need to have an adapter that's going to go from XT60 to JST. And so we probably have like 400 of them somewhere. Now I just need to pause and find them. So we'll be right back. Okay. So the camera crew was reaching through my drawer and she found this. And what this is, is just an XT60 that's been soldered onto a JST connection. So now the, you know, the conventional wisdom would be to just cut off the end and put what you're gonna use on here. And I used to do that for years, but then like 400 planes later, probably, I kind of don't like wasting my time on that anymore. Cause it's just like, I don't care. I'm just gonna put an adapter on it. Now, if this was my only plane and I only had XT60 equipped batteries or I only had IC3 or EC3 equipped batteries, I'd probably just put an end on it. But remember, when you go to the flying field and you're flying with your buddies and you're like, hey, does anybody, I desperately need a 1300 milliamp 2S, which is not a hugely uncommon plane battery, but it is a little bit small for what we've been doing recently. Um, it's nice to be able to do that with the stock end or another end, okay? So, but you do add weight, so keep that in mind. So we've got this at least when we're ready for that. Um, and then obviously we need to put a receiver into this equation. We've talked for a few minutes about this. I'm just gonna grab the actual transmitter as well. So we have a transmitter, we have a battery, and then we have these receivers. Now these are two choices. And honestly, either of them would be perfectly fine. And I'm sort of torn because if we had an AR-410, I'd like to use a 410, but because we don't, we can't really use that. Now the other thing you could do is we have talked about wanting to use this S-Bus PPM mode from a six channel receiver that's a micro receiver. That's one thing we've talked about and we've never done it as well. So maybe we'll do that on one of these builds because that is an S-Bus connection as well. So it's the mode, but if you have S-Bus, that means that all of it goes through a serial bus and then these connections become unnecessary. And you can get some very small receivers. I might take that back, pause for a sec. Okay, so, this is a SRXL2 DSMX receiver, okay? This one does DSMX or DSM2, 2.4 gigahertz, just like everything else. And the only drawback is you would have to have an SRXL2, which has four wires, okay? So that one won't work. This one is an SRXL2 which has four wires and it's a different size. So what would these be used for? These would be used ordinarily for helicopters that are small, that receive a DSMX input so that you can use your NX8 or NX10 or IX whatever, or your, you know, your old DX line um, or whatever you've got, okay? So you can use your Spectrum receiver or also an OpenTX that happens to be, but if you're doing that, you could use Futaba and then they have you know, cheaper options, I think, in that arena. But then this is three wire, and it is a DSMX carbon fuselage remote mount receiver, and then this is a same. So it's DSMX, but it's not SRXL2. I say that very slow because I have a hard time rolling that off my tongue. So. SRXL2 is four wires, SRL2 or SRLX has three, I think. I might be saying that wrong. Um, and see, part of the problem is the nomenclature on this doesn't even identify that because it's just like, this was the way it was. And then this came around and it became two. So they don't like even mark it on there. So that becomes confusing. But what might actually work is you can use this to receive 
your many channels, as many, not as many channels as you want, but a number of channels. I believe there's six channels. But then what you have to do is you have to build an adapter to go from that type of plug, which is three pins, over to a standard plug, and then guess what? Then you can go into the S bus PPM, okay? We've never showed it, but I was just thinking about it because it's such a small dang opening. Hmm. But I think for now, because the helicopters are way smaller still, right. that we probably by rights need to save these. And by the way, these are not exceptionally expensive, but they are a little bit more expensive than just a conventional AR620. And remember, you can take that case off of there. They're not gonna tell you that at Spectrum, but I've done it a number of times and it's worked fine. Okay, so we are gonna, after all, we're probably gonna go with the Lemon because it is the smallest in that size class and then we don't have to use one of these more expensive. These ones, I think these were like about 60 bucks, 65 bucks in that range. So they're still pretty expensive. But this one is cheaper. So we'll link to that and uh, we always like to give you guys different options and we'll show you how to do this. Now just be careful when you unpackage Lemon, you see that 28 millimeters of exposed antennas? Watch this, don't cut them. You will, you will cut them and you will stop it from working and you will create an echo in that logic circuit. So do not cut them, okay? So this comes with a bind plug and they're saving the world with packaging. Hey, note to self, Lemon, stop saving the world and use packaging because I want my crap to get here not crushed. We recently got one that was crushed. Well, it was packed stupid, but whatever. Not a big deal, okay? They made it right to us at least. So pretty basic stuff. We got a little heat shrink around here. And yes, this thing is extremely light. Diversity antennas, these can be manipulated and moved as necessary. I'd like to see the heat shrink cover up the bottom of that and actually over these as well, but it's not, okay? And it is silk screen, but it's extremely hard to read. Uh, wait, I don't see the silk screen. Oh, good Lord. There's no silk screen at all, are you kidding me? What the heck, Lemon? Okay, so that's dumb, but I'm pretty sure I know what it is. This is the bind plug, if I remember right, okay? That's just a guess, to be perfectly frank. I don't know what the bind plug, I don't know which one is the bind plug, but I don't think it's gonna make a big difference. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on my transmitter. We're gonna actually try to get this thing bound up. I'm gonna come off of my model that I'm on, 140, Bushmaster, Bush. Master, add new model. We're gonna create an acro. Okay, so this is where it takes some time because if you have 140 models, the uh, transmitter's like, I give up, leave me alone. I don't have it in me. Okay, then you go to model type and you can choose from here. If you do that, it'll reset everything. Model name. This is where you would type in the model name, which is the FMS F4U uh, Corsair, of course, V2 in the 800 millimeter size class. So I use a legacy keyboard in case you guys were wondering. So I'm gonna go ahead and type that in and then we'll come right back. All right guys, so we have the F4U Corsair V2 800 millimeter. So we just type that in. Then aircraft type, this is where you're gonna have a normal wing type because the reflex is gonna accommodate. Now, if you wanna do flap runs, you would do either dual aerons or flap rounds, okay? And then you would just basically make your adjustment by disconnecting and plugging in different things. I don't recommend it necessarily, but you can technically do it, okay? So I'm gonna go normal and normal tail. I'm gonna scroll over here to select image and standard image file. If you scroll, click on it, and then you can change to an F4U, cool. All right, so back we go. Uh, flight mode setup, we're not gonna have a flight mode on this because we're not using the spectrum setup. We're just using, unless you wanna have an audio event for your stabilizer on off and that sort of thing. And if you are gonna do that, here's what I normally suggest. Let's zoom out just a little bit. This is where I would put flaps if I was doing flaps. This is sort of an unused for special events when I'm doing weird things like flapperons in tandem with flaps, i.e. crow or spoilerons or something. This is where I would do safe AS3X or off, or in this case, st stabilized um, off and auto leveling, but I don't have retracts, which would normally go here. So I like to use this for 
AS3X emulation. In this case, it'd be like just auto leveling, or excuse me, this would be um, stabilized, and then this would be auto leveling. I'm not gonna generally fly planes, especially not small planes, without the stabilizer on. But you may choose to do that, and if you do, that's fine. But there again, why would you buy it with a reflex if you're not gonna take advantage? Just buy it without, it's cheaper. Um, or take it out and use it on a plane where you really need it, okay? Uh, I believe you're gonna need it on this plane, by the way, full disclosure. So I'm gonna go ahead and set switch A to flight mode one and two, and the only reason I'm gonna do that is because I can then name them and make it spoken, okay? Now, remember, these are just labels of the switch condition. So when it's toward my belly, it's in mode two. That's gonna be for us auto leveling, and then that's going to be the stabilization, okay? So I'm gonna type that in right now. Um, basically, as we go, so flight mode is gonna be, instead of flight mode one, I'm gonna cancel, cancel, or click that, that. And then I'm gonna type in, hmm, stabilized. And then that'll show in the display up here. So we'll type and come right back. Okay, so stabilized, and then to make it speak, you have to scroll down. And this one's not quite as far down, I don't think, right, Camp Crew? It is not. So we have to kind of look a little closer. And you could have it just say, AS3X if you want, but it's not AS3X. So try to be correct on that stuff. So you could say like gyro. And it's coming. There's a lot of them though. And it's, oh, it's in alphabetical order. I don't remember that, that's no. kind of weird. Stabilization mode. Divinity mode. Divinity mode. Which is not what that says, that says stabilization mode. Is there a stabilizer on? Divinity mode. What the heck? <laughs> Did I not just change that? It says the same thing, even though yeah. the text is different. Okay, well, that doesn't matter. Oh, and then we're gonna go back to the um, spoken flight modes. And then we're gonna set this to auto leveling. So I'm just gonna type in the words auto leveling. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't set or change any of the function of the aircraft. It's just a label. So we'll be right back. So I typed the word auto leveling, then I'm gonna change this to actually read, <clears throat> I think there's one that's like auto leveling or self level or something like that, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So the word was self level. Self level. Mode. Self and so that's gonna be the word. And then that's gonna be the word and it's gonna go on the display about here during normal flight operations. Okay, cool. We're not going to mess with channel assign, are we? Because we don't really care. We're going to have potentially one extra. So we'll see. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so not that that's super important. First thing that is important is throttle cut. Turn that to switch H, so it's toward the belly. It cuts the throttle. You can tell the throttle's cut because it's at minus 100, regardless of the stick position. Then we're gonna set up a timer. I'm guessing five is probably right. With a one out active, that means over 25% threshold, it starts counting down. From five, clear, clears it. At one minute, I want voice. At 20 seconds, I want nothing. At 10 seconds, I want a voice countdown at expiration. I want tone and vibrate, and then a tone every minute thereafter, okay? Now, people have asked too about audio events. Since we don't have telemetry on this model or we have very limited amounts of telemetry, if anything, then it's not gonna be as helpful on this model. So we'll come back to that. So don't worry, we will cover it. Okay, so then we're gonna bind. We're gonna click in here. It's not gonna actually, it's gonna time out almost certainly, but we are actually at the point where we're gonna bind this thing, which is pretty cool, okay? So I don't even know where things go. I don't know what the polarity is. So it doesn't really matter yet, but we're gonna just try something until we get it right. So throttle is generally gonna be on this port. And I'm assuming that signal is up because that's almost always the way it is. And yes, you can find a manual, but I don't know for sure where it is. So I'm not gonna tell you where to go to find it. Okay. 
Now we're gonna see if this works and I'm gonna secure the plane in case the prop starts. It shouldn't start, but if something goes wrong, well, we got something right. Throttle's injecting power in here, that's kinda cool. Okay, so we're in bind mode, I believe. Now I'm gonna go back into bind. I'm gonna hit yes. Cool, right? Okay, so we got that bound. Now I can take the bind plug out. Whoa, that was kind of scary. You know why that scared me? Because I didn't have anything plugged into those channels and it still came to life because the stabilizer was working. Oh man, that scared the crap out of me. Um, okay, so anyway, throttle cuts on and we're gonna test this. Okay, so it's working so far. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold the plane, shut it off. Very cool. Okay. Throttle cuts on, cleared my timer. Hey, so sometimes you guess and you get it right, which is pretty sweet. Okay, now, if there is a PPM plug, the PPM plug would be on the bind plug. So I'm gonna just try it for fun and see what happens. Probably nothing. Okay. Nothing, nothing. Okay, good. So now that I know that that is incorrect, I can unplug that because it's not gonna do us any good. Now I'm going to literally guess and check until I get it right. Because at this point, that's the only thing you can do since it's not actually silk screened. Okay, so I, I guess that, oh, that is the aileron. So the ailerons are on that port because I just moved the aileron stick and it moved the output of the elevator. Okay, so this is gonna be brown as down, guys. I'm gonna untangle this first, pull that label back just a hair. And you see how I'm just kind of twisting to get it flat. It's gonna make it look better, okay. So now your ailerons are not hooked up, so don't freak out. They're not hooked up to anything, but I can definitely hear them move, okay? We don't know if it's moving the right way, but they're moving, okay? Should be elevator next, usually. Well, I guess normally I would grab what you told me, but I have this in my fingers. So I'll go rudder next after next. That is the rudder. So the elevator, you are correct in your assessment. Brown is down. And you guys are probably thinking to yourself, but how do you know this stuff, Brian? I don't know, probably from the 400 other plans we've done. And yeah, you're right. It's not silk screened onto the board. And when I say silk screen, what I mean is there's actually a print that would be very small and next to each of the pins, okay? Then this is gonna be whatever channel is above all the rest. So it'd be like gear. So we'll just use the gear channel. And then it's also possible, it's also possible, now that we've tried all that, I know where these go. So I'm just gonna try this here and see if channel six is S bus. Oh wait, no, there might be another weird way where you kind of like plug it the other direction, like you unplug this. And then this has to plug in like sideways or something weird. I'm not gonna get into that because it's not necessarily beneficial since I don't have a manual to confirm it. I don't wanna give you guys bad advice. Obviously I never do that. <laughs> um, okay, so all joking aside, I do try to not give you guys bad advice. Okay, so just getting my labels all lined up so that they block each other. Okay, cool. Now this is not spatially aware, so it doesn't matter where it goes. This one is and it does, okay? So now the next move, I'm gonna go ahead and slide this into the hole. In the hole. And then I'm gonna slide this um, up there with it, okay? Okay, so just like that. <clears throat> Very nice. Okay, so now we have some movement that's gonna need to be handled. And uh, we obviously have things plugged in now. So I should be able to check mode by moving whatever was on channel A. You see how that light changes? Now I don't know which one it's supposed to be right, but we're gonna find that out in mere moments, but we know that all of our plugs are plugged into the correct plug. So that's kind of nice. So now I can tuck this away and probably what I'll do is I'll run these like that to protect the plugs. And then I can just, you know, just do one of these doohickeys where I just kind of like literally wrap it into a ball of excitement and get these little in little aileron leads and just kind of slip them down into the opening there. 
I don't know if I have enough length, but we're gonna find out in mere moments, guys. Look at that, pretty good stuff. Not bad, not bad, guys, I must say. I'm pretty happy with that, given the fact that this is such a tight plane and that AR620, although it would work just fine, um, I think it would have taken up a little bit more room. Okay, so I'm happy with that. And then these antennas should be 90 degrees of each other. Ooh, I do have an idea for that. And we've done it before and it's worked well, it's served us well. You could tape them down, but the tape doesn't like to stick to that foam. And so what I've found works really nice for that is to take and drop whatever it is you're holding on the floor. Okay, so I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna take some forceps so I can film it easier. You could do it without forceps if you're not filming. I'm just gonna grab the end of it like this. And then watch this fancy dance. This is amazing stuff right here. Camera crew, get ready to be excited. Okay, so I'm just taking, I'm just gonna ram it in. She does get excited when I ram it in usually. Whoops. I rammed it in so, so far I, I can't uh, get it out. Okay, so I rammed it in. Now I'm gonna take this and ram it in to follow up. And so in order to do that, I need to grab the antenna like so. Where is the hole? I'm blindly probing. Well, that's not usually a good idea. Well, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? I'm putting the wrong hole. Well, I mean, it is kind of annoying. I swear, I just, I pierced it perfectly. I can sort of see, oh, I did it right on the edge, folks. Right on the edge, so you can see. Okay, okay so now I'm just gonna put this into the hole and stick it up into the hole. Okay, all right, so it's in the hole. Then I'm going to take one and I'm gonna try to get this to run the other direction. So I'm just gonna go like this. Now, 90 degrees would be like this or this or that. Um, they don't need to be square to the plane at all. It's just the 90 degrees from one another so that you get the maximum diversity. Now we have plenty of length that I can just cram this right in there in that hole. Pretty cool, huh? And I don't think I made it out yet. Okay, so that's great. So that is pretty well protected now, which is nice. Not perfect, but it's, it's good enough for a 10 second operation, okay? Mm -hmm. We don't do many 10 second operations here on Brian Phillips RC because mm -hmm. I'm involved. You may have noticed. Okay, so now the next move is to put the canopy on so we can see just how dang beautiful this thing has gotten to be. Oh yes, oh, we gotta get that cable. It's so huge. It's pretty huge actually, huge. I know, huge. I'm gonna put this under the bottom. I'm gonna drop the XT adapter, XT60 adapter down. Then I'm just gonna slide this in. Oh yeah, perfect. Nice. Look at that, that's gorgeous. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to figure out uh, if we're in auto leveling or not. And what's the easiest way to tell? Normally you'd flip the plane over and the ailerons would respond, but you can tell they're trying to find level. Yeah. So <laughs> I can, so I have it backward, okay? How do we fix that first problem? Let's show you. I have it backward. So I'm gonna click, I'm gonna go to servo setup, I'm gonna go to travel, I'm gonna click over to reverse and I'm gonna go to gear, I'm gonna rotate, okay? Now, watch when I flip this over, we'll go It's moving, but it's not It's gonna do that as soon as I put auto leveling on. Easiest way to tell, okay? So I'm in stability mode. So now we need to put our linkages onto our control surfaces. So the ailerons are now not being stable. They're being stabilized, but not auto leveled. So because of that, uh, let's check what the instructions say, if they say. Sometimes they say, sometimes they don't. Yeah, which hole do we stick it in? Yeah, install the horns. Ooh, look at that fancy dance. They used a brush on there, it's fancy dance. Mm. Here, we'll come over here, see if we can see. Um, okay, so install the rubber horn on the side. Okay, so that's, 
Oh, install the aileron control horn in the bottom side of the main wing. And where does it say? It doesn't say so far. Usually there's just a little diagram at the end. Yeah, I'm not seeing that yet though. Okay, so you can ignore some of that stuff. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. This is one of the older ones. Oh, outside hole, outermost hole, okay? So that's good. So we'll put it into the outermost hole and the outermost hole meaning on the servo. And you kind of got to decide when you, whether you want it that way or if you want it this way. I would suggest going this way. Um, okay, then I want this to be flush with the wing surface. And so I got to bring this in just a little bit, probably like half a turn maybe. Did your fuel tube chunk stay on there? Yeah, it's okay. underneath my Oh, yep, fingers. I see it. Okay, so that's pretty dang close. So I think we're good there. And then now you can stick this little head into that now, but once you're there, it's not gonna come undone very easy. Ouch. Okay, so you see how, how easy that would be for that to come undone? And then this, don't go all the way off the edge, but right there. So now, now your control surface moves. Fancy dance. And I'm kind of thinking we're gonna have an anemic roll rate with that much deflection. So we might need to go into the inside hole um, for more and more. So the middle hole gives you more movement and even more movement. And then as you go closer and closer to the output shaft on the servo, you're gonna get more precision movement, okay? So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'll go on the inside, go to the top hole, the outermost hole, give it a 90 degree pivot. I'm gonna take my fingers and squish this so it's in place. And I wanna extend that out Half a turn, one turn, one and a half turns, two turns, two and a half turns. Okay, so about two and a half turns. And yours may be different. Okay, another half a turn. Okay, so there's three full turns, goodness gracious. And that'll keep that right in the center. So it should be good there. I'm gonna snap this in. It does kind of stab you, so Ooh, there we go. All right, so then slide the fuel tube and then look at that. We have functioning ailerons. Now we don't know that the direction is correct yet, but we'll just go ahead and get these done while we're underneath the plane. Okay. Elevator. Okay. So now this one's way screwed in. Okay. So we can screw that out a ton. Make sure it doesn't get to the point where it just yanks off the end. We've had that problem. Goodness gracious. That's Ooh, it's got a long way to go. Yes, it does. And that means we're going to have to adjust it a different way, which I'll show you in mere moments. Three fingers holding tight. It's wanting to unscrew on the other end. I finally got it to start. Okay, I can still see exposed thread. So we're still good. Okay, I can get this one to go and it's okay. Because again, same thing, I wanna hold that stationary and then get that walked out to the correct position. I need to go another half turn probably. Okay, holding that there, oof, another half turn. Okay, that's pretty tight. That's pretty tight. I pulled hard on it and it didn't come out. So you do have to try to sometimes break things to prevent breaking things. Okay. So now I'm going to check that again. We want to make sure, oh, that's actually down just a hair, I think. Hmm. Kind of hard to say. I think it's okay. There's just a lot of slop on the hole, you know? Hmm. Generally you want a hole to be a, a good fit. You want it to slide in and be tight not slide in and be slopped like that because that means as your servo moves, there's gonna be slop. If it's a tight hole, it's just way more satisfying. Correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so then this, um, you see how we're having to bend it over like that, that's not so good and we are unscrewed quite a bit. So now we need to do a little bit of due diligence before we can continue, unfortunately. So I am going to get the rudder right now and cam crew's gonna keep me accountable to get that hooked up. Okay, okay so three fingers, one, Two, three, okay? It's actually two fingers and a thumb, okay? Turning in, turning in, turning in, turning in, turning in. Don't click your head into the little thingy, okay? So we gotta go ways on Wait this. In. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so let's see, we're getting closer. 10, 11, 12. And you guys may notice I count. Uh, creature of habit thing. I do that for work because I'm turning trim pots. And when I turn trim pots to make adjustments on some of the equipment I work on, 
I keep track of my turns in case I need to unturn them. Okay. If you guys here are, uh, we have a whale in the basement that is trying to escape its fish tank. So if you hear that, that's normal. That noise. Just kidding, guys. We don't have a whale. We got rid of that whale well a long time ago. It's actually some swings we got the kids for Christmas. Correct? Mm -hmm. The kids, we have four children that are downstairs playing. And this is what happens when you have a YouTube channel with hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of footage. The kids get to help make the footage by not helping because we want to make really super high quality content here, obviously, because what? I say it's not lined up at the top, even though it's lined up at the bottom. Mm, well, is that the mm, bend issue? No, it's we got to pick one. Yeah, I'm okay. picking the bottom, and then we'll just have to pull it. Mm, okay, mm. see that? Yep. We may need to put. You remember this? Yeah. We may need to ram that in there so we can get some rigidity once it's where we want it. Mm-hmm. Which that's a scary thing to do because it's not that's very not very thick. thick. Yeah, and it could look really bad, but. I'd probably better to move the rudder and then see if I can stab it in that way. But we'll just see. It's probably not going to be as big a consequential thing as we think it is right now. But you see, you can also heat this and it will hold its shape eventually. So I think we're good there. Okay. And not very much movement. That's like going to be fiercely ineffective. Okay, so now the elevators, as you can see, we have only one working. Okay, and it's going backward. Um, so let's go ahead and rotate. Let's just check this quick. That's wrong. That's wrong. And that's right. Okay, so we can go in here, servo setup, travel, reverse, ailerons, roll left, roll right. And sometimes when you reverse the direction of travel, you'll actually find that there's a small, a small change in the center, which I don't know why that is. Okay, elevator up. Okay, nope. So we'll go here. Elevator up, elevator down. Y'all left, y'all right. Roll left, roll right. And how do we know? When this goes up, it's going to pull that wing down. That one goes up, it's going to push the wing up. That's going to roll you this way. Roll, roll, up, down, y'all left, y'all right. Okay? Get in the habit of practicing that if you're in any doubt. And then you can do that right before you start flying as a check. See what I'm talking about, guys? It's going to be a little challenging to get that canopy off. Okay, so um, we obviously need this one hooked up and we need some more length out of that, probably another good quarter inch. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna grab from our non-flower vase, flower vase. We're gonna grab, ooh, I don't know if it's a 1.5 millimeter maybe. Move the elevator for me. Yep, that's it, okay. So I'm grabbing one of the two. I'm gonna loosen this. And then I'm gonna pull out just a little bit and then I'm gonna tighten it back without changing the other position if possible. Now, you can see we got plenty of length. We should be close. And we have to reevaluate the other side too now because there's probably a 90% certainty that we screwed up the other side in doing that. Okay, and I'm not even gonna put my, yeah, see we, we screwed that up just a little bit. It's not terrible, but you know what, it's probably easier now that we've done that to just loosen this screw and just get this one right where it needs to be. Now that we've already got this side done, you know? Okay. okay. So now this side I can do from down here if I want, but I just want to hold this level just like before and get that adjusted. So I need to come out like half a turn. Oh yeah, that's on there good still. And when we had the <clears throat> SU-27 uh, crash, we definitely had one of these pull out and we lost that plane because of it. So you wanna be careful about that. Um, but I'm gonna be the first to admit, you, I mean, there are certain things that we check and you just, like, you just kind of do it while you're building the plane. And I mean, I didn't go out of my way to, you know, pull super hard on those. They were already built on the plane. Mm -hmm. So that's the responsibility of the manufacturer. And then some would argue that it's my responsibility to go and check everything the manufacturer did. And I'm like, sorry, not happening. This isn't a real plane. Nobody died when that thing crashed. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, it would be unreasonable to assume that you're going to check every single linkage on every single plane before you fly every single plane. Yeah. It's not like you've got lives on the line. That's why you do real checks on real planes before you fly. But you do, che you do checks, a little bit more thorough checks on brand new planes. So elevator up, elevator down. Y'all left, y'all right, roll left, roll right. Okay, so everything is uh, going the right direction. So we'll put this back on. And as you can see, this plane is pretty much ready to fly right now. But we have one more thing to check and that is stabilizer, okay? The stabilizer is going to be correcting in one direction or another, mm. or it's gonna be automatically leveling. So auto leveling is here, okay? So you can see the ailerons are just pretty neutral. So if I were to roll, look what's happening. It's trying to bring this wing up, trying to bring that wing down. And we can get to the extreme setting here where it flips the other direction. Finds the quickest route to level. Now look at the elevator. See, when it's this way, as it levels, it goes back to neutral. Now, if you were pointed up and you did the same, you can see the elevator's trying to pull the nose level, okay? Now, the rudder does not do the same thing, you'll see. It doesn't try to level with the rudder. On auto leveling, most planes that have an angle demand feature or auto leveling, they only use the roll and the pitch axis. They don't use the yaw axis, but there are some more sophisticated stabilizers that will do things like that. We just don't use them much. Okay. All right. So very cool. So we know the angle demand works, the auto leveling. Now we need to see if the stabilizer is working. How do we tell if the stabilizer is working? We have to move the surface up and move it down and we can see, and I can see, and I can see. Now I'm going to move the rudder this way and watch the rudder to go the same direction I'm moving. You're never going to see it from that angle. And I'm going to have to hold the camera like I do. I can definitely tell it's going the right direction. Now I'm going to use the ailerons up and aileron down and the other aileron up and all, all the way down. So in order to show you this, I'm going to have to make some of you guys seasick. Okay. So here's how this works. You're going to watch right on the edge of the surface. Okay. Now I'm going to lift this plane. Oops. Kind of grabbing my doohickey here. So now watch, I'm going to turn this up and down and up and you can see it goes up. And when I stop, it stops. When I go down, it goes down. When I go up, it goes up. Same thing here, okay? So you see, I'm gonna give you an ultra close up. Okay, we're going up, it goes up. We're going down, it goes down. See, it's very subtle. Up, it goes up. And then when I stop, go down, it goes down. Okay, now rudder, I'm gonna rotate to my left. It's gonna resist. I'm going to go to the right and it's going to resist a little bit harder to see on that axis of control and then elevator same thing okay just going to try to get right up there elevator up elevator down elevator up okay so you get the point the idea is i can see in real life but it's just hard to demonstrate it on camera okay now one thing that's nice that we have found about safe and the S3X is that when we do have to stabilize check, we can turn the gains up and we did that on the zero. So you can see how that works if you want. But I mean, honestly guys, this thing is ready to fly. So I'm just gonna go a little bit of throttle just to see it spin. Oh, that is so sweet. That is so sweet. Hey. Love it guys. Absolutely gorgeous looking plane. So cool. And can't wait to see this thing in the air. Let me go ahead and put my throttle cut on and test it. So as you can see, there's more than one way to skin a cat. We've talked about that numerous times on Brian Phillips RC. And we want you guys to understand that we're never trying to funnel you into one particular item versus another particular item. If you like the Zero better, you can get the Zero. If you like the F4U Corsair better, you can get the F4U Corsair. If you like some other product, you can get that too. But what we do here on this channel is we give you a no BS review that shows you some of the high points and low points. Here's one of the low points. This doesn't have LEDs. I would like to see LEDs on this plane, okay? But that one doesn't, and most planes in this size class don't until you get to the more expensive ones that cost, you know, 150 bucks. So this one is, and, and that would be even even smaller plane, about half the size, and you might get LEDs. So I love that this thing has the tech built into it for auto leveling and stabilization. And I love the fact that it has an absolutely gorgeous prop. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind when you break that, you're gonna have to buy this one. 
So if you're new to the hobby and you're not sure what you're gonna do, first of all, I would not generally recommend an F4U Corsair. They tend to have a lot of P factor issues and they are warbirds. Warbirds have a history of being classified as harder to fly. I started with warbirds and I didn't have a huge issue. I started with like a cub. And then I think my second plane that was of any substance that was big enough was a P-51 like mm -hmm. this. Yep. So, I mean, I also crash it a few times, like in the light poles and curbs. But the thing is, like, I didn't quit. It wasn't like a big deal. But that being said, Corsairs have an especially bad reputation for being a little bit challenging to fly. And that's where the reflex comes in. And if you aren't using the reflex opposite AS3X, that would come in. So you can also use a lemon receiver that has a stabilizer and they're okay for this application because it's a seven channel uh, with stabilization, similar to what we used on the Omp Hobby that we just did the other day. But we want you guys to know that there are always options. It's not like you have to go with the Spectrum every time, but we do tend to lean towards Spectrum because we've had such good luck with them. And I know some of you guys are gonna say, oh, I've had nothing but bad luck or whatever. I, I don't understand what you're doing differently than me. We've had very good luck with Spectrum. We've also had very good luck with Lemon. We've had good luck with a few other brands. But generally, when you start deviating from the big ones, we have started to have more and more rates mm -hmm. of failure where we have complete brownouts and we're flying along and just like, there goes the brown bear. Or what was that? That was a rare bear that was going about 100 miles an hour and it oh, I was thinking we did that with that a, also, the Zod yep. something. Yep, the Zod about 110 miles an hour into the ground. That was scary. And fortunately, we're out in the boonies and we're in class G airspace and we're way the heck away from everybody. So it works out good in that regard. But you never like to see that. And so I've had one bad experience on Lemon one time. And that was with a plane that I was pushing my ranges past where I think they were supposed to be. And it caused the, the DSMP protocol to not work right. And so it actually got jammed out of mode and reset the receiver. And so Esteban, my friend, had to climb a tree. And then funny story is, he got pulled over by the cops for running a stop sign, like a moron. And, uh, and he did run it. He just like rolled through it slowly. And <laughs> they were like, excuse me, sir, why are you all scratched up? <laughs> so they thought he had like broken into somebody's house. <laughs> oh, it was hilarious. Oh, I wish I could have been there. Um, anyway, I would be like, I don't know what happened to him, officer. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, so if you're gonna crash into a tree, be careful that when you're scratched up, you, you mind your P's and Q's and don't run stop signs. But uh, anyway, this plane looks awesome. I'm excited to share it with you. We love the fact that we work with all these great brands that bring good stuff to the hobby and are advancing the hobby because at the end of the day, guys, don't forget, there are a million easier businesses to make money at than radio controlled flying objects, okay? Yes. You know, like virtually any of the things of you them. can do. <laughs> so let's not punish these companies that have gone out on a limb because they also love them. The, if you didn't love these things, you wouldn't be marketing them, I promise you. The guys that are marketing these things, they love them. It's not like the only thing they could do to make money and so I don't wanna make it a thing, but at the end of the day, <laughs> There are so many easier things like radio controlled cars, radio controlled trucks, radio controlled boats, radio controlled crawlers, radio controlled anything that sits on the ground, tracked vehicles, you know, trains. You know, the, the airplanes are the hardest to make. They have the most regulation involved. They are the smallest customer base and they are also some of the most loyal people. So you have to kind of weigh that when you're saying, oh man, that's 150 instead of 140. Really? <laughs> Today's day and age with the props we have. So anyway, just keep that in mind, guys. When we ask you to buy things, we're not asking you to buy this thing. We're asking you to just buy them from the links when you do choose to buy something. And that's how you support Brian Phillips RC, predominantly. Um, also, like the videos, that helps. Click the bell for notifications. Um, Obviously, like and subscribe like everybody else says. If you aren't subscribed, I'd be surprised, but subscribe. And then there's Patreon and PayPal. We have a small group of people that send us money on a regular basis through Patreon. And it's not like it's enough to live on, but it is really nice. And it does help take the edge off of some of the tight months. Um, but at some point, 
you know, as time goes, there's more of you. And so we really appreciate you and you make a bigger impact on the channel and the performance that we have here. But the best thing you can do and the biggest impact you can have is buying these amazing products because we wanna grow the hobby. We wanna sell a lot of products for the vendors that choose to trust us to bring you good quality reviews. And also we're truthful about what the shortcomings are and they still work with us. Do you wanna know why that happens? because you guys go out and you buy the stuff that we bring to you on YouTube. If you didn't, they wouldn't. They would be like, why are we gonna let this guy badmouth our product that we worked hard on? And they did. Even my complaints like no LEDs or maybe a landing gear breaks off easy or you know, I screw up and hit an iceberg out there and break it in half or whatever it happens to be. Sometimes I screw up and I try to own it. Other times the plane screw up like the, the SU-27 SU the other day screwed up. That was the plane's fault. And usually it's a pilot error, but that was not. Okay. Um, and they still work with us. You know why? Because we help to generate some sales for them because you guys buy stuff when it's good and we help you decide that it's good. So hopefully that's the sales pitch that we really want you to hear is that these things are awesome and we love them. And the more you guys buy these things, the more you help support Brian Phillips RC really at the end of the day. So awesome plane. Cannot wait to get this thing in the air so you can see how it actually performs because sometimes they suck. But this one's gonna be great. I think it's gonna be great. It looks gorgeous. I can't wait to see it in the air. And I know you guys are gonna come back for so much more because Brian Phillips RC is on a roll. We've got so much stuff sitting ready to get unpackaged and reviewed. And we know you guys are gonna love them and you'll be with us for the next however long it is. And we know you'll come back because we have the world's best audience right here on Brian Phillips RC on YouTube. So thanks for watching. Oh, also don't forget to check out Brian Phillips RC com, which is our website. If you have trouble finding videos about a particular aircraft, or if you can't find a link, or you're looking for like a coupon code or something like that, you want to try to pair that up with helping to support us. We have links to buy the planes, but we also have some links that will help you with coupon discount codes, things like that. And we try to keep them as accurate as possible. If you ever see a broken link, please do let us know. We're going through another link revolve, revival, which is a huge pain in the butt. Camera crew has been working like crazy to get that updated and it's gonna be bprc.me. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be our short link, and then it's gonna have something after it, and that way we can see analytics about where the clicks are coming from and things like that. And then when our vendors change links again for the 50th time, which is extremely difficult for us, then we can keep on top of it. But please do let us know. We really appreciate it when you let us know when a link is broken because it's like impossible for us to check mm, every link. It's so hard to find. We literally could not do it. We could have 100 people on staff and we would miss that. And you want to know how many people, how many people do we have on staff? Um, I don't think I'm actually on staff. Well, I mean, don't get paid. But. <laughs> well, then we also have some other helpers. But yes. the helpers are relatives. <laughs> 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 they live here, so yes. we feed them. Yeah. <laughs> but beyond that, we love bringing you guys this quality RC content in long format, which you guys have been demanding. And so we're going to keep doing it for the foreseeable future until we come up with a better way to kind of keep everybody happy and still bring high quality content. But right now, that's just what we're doing. So stay tuned. We forgot to talk about CG. Sorry, guys. 50 millimeters from the leading edge as per the manual. So grab yourself some calipers or measuring tape or whatever you wanna use. And get it set to about 50, okay? And then we're gonna go from the leading edge back and I'm just gonna make a bump. I'm gonna come over to the other side. I'm gonna do the same thing. That is really weird. It feels like that was Now we can take and mark this to darken it. And uh, some of you are probably thinking that's hideous, but the truth is, as hideous as it is, it will be easy to find and it will work just fine. And we've done it like that hundreds of times, it worked well for us. Now, this plane has to be put upside down to check the CG. So I'm gonna put my middle finger onto it and I can feel it. So you guys can see that's pretty dang good actually. Yeah. So surprisingly a good CG experience. That's not always the case. Definitely excited to see this plane, this F4U4 Corsair. It's a V2 from FMS. We're gonna be flying ours really soon. So if you guys 
haven't already connected the dots, this is the Unbox Build Radio setup, and the flight actually publishes one minute after this video. So if you're like, well, wait, where's the flight? We separated them because our Unbox Build Radio setups are long, and people have been asking that we separate them so that you could just watch the video and kind of move the status bar so you can see something again over and over again. Like for instance, when I crash into the house or something embarrassing happens that you want to watch over and over again for your pure enjoyment at my destruction. But anyway, guys, if you wanna see that, there's also playlists for every single plane on our channel. And sometimes they're just one play, uh, just one video. But a lot of times it's more than one. Sometimes it's like 40 or 50 videos about one plane. And that's what you get at Brian Phillips RC, extremely long footage. So stay tuned, so much more. Thanks for watching, guys.